Did somebody say Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny? Because that's what we're talking about on today's episode of Make Cinema. And it starts right now. Aloha and welcome back to my channel. Today's make is an embroidered illustration while I talk Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Stick around to the end to see how it turns out. Directed by James Mangold, known for Ford vs. Ferrari and Logan, Indy 5 follows Indiana Jones and his goddaughter as they race against time to find an ancient relic called the Antikythera. I know, really rolls off the tongue. It's known as the dial that could change the course of history. Shifting to numbers as of the weekend ending July 9th, 2023, it's done 121.2 million domestically, 126.7 million internationally, thus bringing us a worldwide total of $247.9 million. The movie was released on July 4th weekend, so it was able to take advantage of holiday sales. The alleged budget was somewhere in the realm of $325 million, but could be more. Using these numbers, I found that it would have to make at least $77 million more just to break even, which may prove difficult as Barbenheimer weekend approaches. The film received a cinema score of B+. A movie's cinema score is calculated by polling moviegoers at major movie releases on opening night. On Rotten Tomatoes, it's fresh with a critical score of 69% and an audience score of 88%. A movie is so much more than just good or bad, so make sure to support movie going, see it for yourself, and form your own opinion. This is mine. I'm not even gonna lie, I had a good time watching this movie, especially the first 20 minutes. It felt like such a solid tribute to Indiana Jones, but as the movie gets further and further into it, I could feel it unraveling, bursting at the seams. Let's start at the top with direction. This movie faces an uphill battle as the 2008 movie Kingdom of the Crystal Skull wasn't well received and the last of the original trilogy was released in 1989. James Mangold did a fantastic job with the script that he was given and the legacy that comes along with Indy, but ultimately I didn't feel like this movie capture the action in the way we're used to getting from these movies. The iconic transition at the beginning was so bizarre to me. In the last movie, the Paramount logo transitioned into a pile of dirt that a groundhog then popped out of. In this one, the Lucasfilm logo turns into a door latch. That is because the distribution rights are now held by Disney and not Paramount for the first time. I even found it hard to feel the classic indie vibe. I mean, he barely even used his whip, and when he did, it wasn't in a useful way like he has done so many times before. The violence was brutal. I found myself wincing way more in this one than the others. The series is violent, so I shouldn't have been surprised by the sudden deaths, but they still had me like the guys from Friday. Damn! Bitch, I wasn't ready for all of that, especially the death of innocent victims, which really got to me. One shot that really bugged me is when they're down in the tomb and they're looking at a symbol and it had me full on Ariana Grande mode, girl. I was squinting the house. I was like, what, what is that? It looked cool, out of focus, but an artist in the production design department probably worked hard on that piece of art only for me to be squinting at a big ass movie screen. We also got to keep in mind that this movie has been passed around like a hot potato to many directors for years most claiming creative differences. I wonder why. So while the movie missed the mark for me, I want to give James his flowers for the amount of work that he put into this film. The screenplay was written by several people and has also been tweaked, edited, erased, and rewritten so many times it doesn't even know that it's an Indiana Jones movie. The writers include Jez and John Henry Butterworth. Jez wrote Spectre. John Henry created the Hulu series Nine Perfect Strangers and together, They've worked on Ford v. Ferrari and Edge of Tomorrow. David Cope wrote Kimmy Premium Rush and 2008's indie Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. James Mangold, the director, also contributed to the script. The screenplay was all over the place. One minute we're in a short film featuring a de-aged Harrison Ford that feels relatively indie, and the next, he's being abandoned by his own goddaughter. There are several other plot points that bothered me, which we'll go over throughout the video. But first, I want to talk about where we left off in 2008. At the end of Crystal Skull, Indy and Marion 
get married. His son, Mutt, catches Indy's hat and Indiana grabs it before Mutt can put it on, kind of leaving the door open, but not really. That's as close to a perfect ending Indiana Jones could get. Married, son alive, incredible legacy, young enough to go on more adventures in the future. What more could he ask for? But even before that, he got his send-off in Last Crusade. I mean, they literally rode off into the sunset. In my opinion, Indiana Jones should have stayed in 80s Gem. The reality is that young people aren't interested in another Indiana Jones movie as millennials and Gen Z didn't grow up on the series. I mean, the older millennials did, but the youngers didn't. I was 12 in 2008 and I didn't grow up on the series, but I'm familiar with Indy because of the ride at Disneyland. Temple of the Forbidden Eye, now called Indiana Jones Adventure, opened on March 3rd, 1995. In middle school, I received a magical Christmas gift, a Disneyland annual pass. You just had to be there. So I was at the parks all the time with my friends, and we'd go single rider on Indy because the queue for that ride is insane at all times of day, and it breaks down a lot. I have such a love for that ride, so naturally I admire Indy and his story. Disney acquired the rights to the Indiana Jones franchise back in 2013, which is great for them, but they should have left it alone. I don't know whose idea this movie was, but many people are pointing fingers at Kathleen Kennedy, which fans have been doing for a while now as they didn't agree with her handling of Star Wars as president of Lucasfilm. Crystal Skull shouldn't have happened and neither should have this one. I rewatched Crystal Skull the other day and I was surprised by how much I enjoyed it. It felt indie, way more than Dial did. Yes, it had some cringy moments, but it certainly wasn't as bad as some people online say. I mean, they talk about it as if it's a deplorable film. Stop. Just stop. Shia LaBeouf was in it. So what? This was at the height of his Transformers fame, so for the time, the casting choice made sense. Its budget was a sensible $185 million. And you want to know how much they made in the box office? Yeah, $790 million. Wow. So no matter what the critics or the haters may say about it. It made a pretty penny. In between four and five, we find out that Mutt was killed in the Vietnam War and Indiana's wife, Marion, left him as a result. They really sat down in 2018 or whenever they were developing this movie and said, let's unravel everything they've built. Indy is known as a strong, adventurous man. He should be remembered as such. This movie goes on to emasculate him multiple times. He scales a mountain at 70. 70! Granted, Harrison Ford is in fantastic shape for 80, almost 81 years old, but his age restricts him from doing the massive action sequences he's done in the past. He's simply too old to give us the indie we're used to, and that isn't a bad thing. He isn't superhuman, and neither is Indy. If you want to talk about all over the place, the action in this movie, just car chase after car chase... Planes, trains, automobiles, animals, car chase, car chase, betrayal. It's just hard for me to see any love or care put into this writing. And you'd think there would be something in there, considering how many people had their hands in the script. It's make-believe. I get it. There's not a whole lot of realism, because if there was, Indiana would have died a long time ago. But there were a few things that didn't make sense to me. Spoilers ahead. First off, I don't know who decided to call the time anomalies fissures, because the only thing I think of are anal fissures, which I guess kind of works since they did fly through an asshole in the sky. Secondly, Dr. Voller Schmidt, yeah, he should have died at the beginning. Listen, I get that that would mean he wouldn't be the villain, but come on. As Andrew said, he channeled full on hereditary. His ass was hit by a pole and then proceeded to fall off a train at a high speed. How is he still alive? And not only is he alive, he became the antagonist of the whole damn film. Three, when they finally get to the tomb of Archimedes, Indy is the one to figure out the main puzzles, which feels correct. But apparently, he isn't affected by toxic methane. I mean, Helena is in the corner having a full-on cough attack, and Indy is over here Cracking the code, doing the work. I got two more. Number four, Teddy flying the plane. Stop. 
and in horrendous weather conditions, just stop. We're supposed to believe the man in the back just slept through it all. Then he woke up and said, hey, kid, I'll help you. huh?" Helena could have flown the second plane. She didn't have to force this child to traverse the interdimensional planes of space and time. Whew. I'm just overwhelmed thinking about it. Finally, so much happened in between the punch and Indiana waking up from the coma. So let me get this straight. They somehow reversed the coordinates, got back to Sicily, changed his clothes, flew back to New York, and put him in his bed. Then he wakes up like, no biggie. How long have I been out? Just a couple hours? Okay, (laughs) yeah. The damn dial had me confused the entire movie. I thought it would predict the end of time or the next mass extinction event, but what it actually did was so convoluted that after it ended, I still didn't get what it did. Andrew had to break it down for me and I was still lost. And I can grasp some pretty deep shit. Where's the power of God that it claims to have? Because now that I think about it, it may have still caused some damage even though Helena knocked Indy out. There's all those dead bad guys just lying on the beach. That could cause a time issue too, right? A temporal anomaly. If you were the Romans, wouldn't you investigate them? See what's going on? I didn't even care about the damn dial, which I should have. The part I loved is when Indy burns the tablet to reveal the directions underneath. I was surprised Nicolas Cage didn't pop out of the water, but I wasn't intrigued because I didn't get why it was so important until the very end the whole time. I'm wondering why should we care about this in the first place? Because the movie started with a completely different relic, the Holy Lance, which is alleged to have pierced the side of Jesus as he hung on the cross. That seems like a big deal. It then turns out to be a fake and we're just supposed to forget about it and then care about some supersized compass. But more than anything else, the budget for this movie will be its downfall. Allegedly in the ballpark of $325 million. They had to know that making an indie movie in the 2020s was going to be a gamble. But despite how full my theater was on a Sunday night, the numbers aren't impressive for an indie movie released on a holiday weekend. This picture never should have been greenlit in the first place. These big studios gotta tone it down on these insane budgets because they just aren't seeing the returns they thought they'd get. Or they thought they would manifest. And this is during the summer season when a larger than normal amount of people are going to the theater. It puts even more emphasis on the poor decisions that streaming services made during the pandemic. Because people are being pickier about what they go out to see in theaters. There are simply too many options on streaming because people can save money and time just staying home and watching Chris Hemsworth extract some bitches. Side note, I watched Extraction, and I'll watch Extraction 2 this week. Don't you worry about that. And, okay, okay, you know what? They did that. Okay, girl, let me just take a moment to cool down. I know, I've been a little brutal, but I'm going to say what I got to say. So, now, let me talk about what I liked. It might be a short paragraph, but it's something. The prologue was a short film that just worked. Not every bit of it. You know, the de-aging situation is a separate issue, and I'm not going to go into all of that. But overall, it was a solid start, and I appreciate the work they put into it. I'm still on the side of the people that say they should have just cast a young person to play young Indy. Or just use the man that you used as his stunt double. Indy hanging from a rope during a huge explosion that somehow knocks him off the pole and narrowly saves his ass What a sequence. Wow. One random part I thought was satisfying is when Helena drops the soldiers out of the plane. Really one of the only helpful moments she has in this movie. The best performance is by John Reese davies as Sala. He's energetic, he reminds us of the OG indie trilogy, and he was given a lovely ending. He's happy. Really the only person who's happy in this film. Let me just talk about the cast and characters real quick. Helena is a selfish asshole who puts herself before anything else. Phoebe Waller-Bridge couldn't even act her way out of the writing. You know, normally she's quite likable. She said she's a particular taste, you know, caviar of the industry. But Helena didn't even have 
character growth written into her arc. She's felt like the same person she was at the end when she started at the beginning. The chemistry between Harrison Ford and Phoebe Waller-Bridge, I'm so sorry, bitch, point me to the lost and found box because I'm looking for some chemistry because there was none, nowhere to be found. They never really find common ground that we can trust and it's just not a relationship that we can root for. I think this is mostly because of how poorly written Helena is. Mads Mikkelsen as evil Nazi doctor, fantastic as usual. Antonio Banderas and Boyd Holbrook were wasted opportunities. Antonio was on the screen for maybe five minutes. I said, okay, get your check, but I would have liked a little bit more. I didn't even get who Boyd's character was. Why was he so reckless? How was he radicalized? I, yeah, I don't know. Another wasted opportunity was not putting Ki Hui Kwan in this film. No brainer. Mason, Agent Mason, or whatever her name is, dumb as a bag of rocks. They wrote her so dumb, it was borderline offensive. How did she not know she was in the lion's den? When that man, Boyd's character, whatever his name was, when that man shot two innocent people, I would have been packing my fucking bags. Like, agent to base, agent to base, we got a problem. <laughs> we got a problem in New York. And yet, she thinks this old professor is the threat. Okay, girl. Plus, why would the bad guys work with a black woman if they saw anyone non-white as inferior? She couldn't smell their disgusting racism. I, uh, come on, guys. Give this queen a little bit more credit. I didn't even get that she was with the CIA for a long time. I guess they might have said it in one moment and I missed it. I bet there's people who walked out of the theater never even knowing she was in the CIA. Plus the whole plot point framing indie is just, it's just weak and unnecessary. Speaking of unnecessary, hi Teddy, his uni threw me off multiple times. Helena could have shown him how to groom himself, but she was too busy worrying about herself. Never mind. That tracks. Harrison Ford was great. I mean, he did what he does. He did the best <laughs> with what he was given. I honestly don't know why he agreed to do the film in the first place, but I'm sure it was a thick check. And Harrison loves storytelling and he loves this character and he understands the impact that it has had on so many people's lives. So on the other hand, I get why he wanted to do one final indie film. Finally, the ending? No. And if they decide to keep this franchise going and this was a fake out, I'm not seeing it. I'm not supporting it. I think I would have rather seen him die in an epic way. Maybe even pull a Dark Knight death and die but not die, you know? I just could have seen it handled a thousand other ways, way better than the way that we got. Now it's time for me to play producer and do a little segment I call Genie in a Bottle. I'm a genie in a bottle, baby. If I could rub a lamp and get three or nine wishes when it comes to Dial of Destiny, here's what I'd wish for. Number one, I would have made it shorter. Two hours and 34 minutes was too long, especially when there was so much padding that could have been cut. The underwater scene, too long. Also, eels are not snakes. That's all I'm going to say on that. Number two, I would have tapped Steven Spielberg to direct. Plain and simple. Oh, he's not available? We can't make another Indiana Jones movie then. George Lucas can't concept? No movie. Their input would have made this movie feel inherently Indiana Jones. There would be more puzzles, less de-aging, and no awkward game of geriatric Are You Nervous? In fact, Dial of Destiny is the first and only film in the franchise that is neither directed by Steven Spielberg nor conceived by George Lucas, but both served as executive producers. That should tell you everything you need to know. Three, Teddy should have given Indy his friend's lighter instead of keeping it. You know, Antonio's character, his lighter, Teddy stole it and just kept it. I thought we were going to see him give it back to Indy near the end because, you know, he died, but no. Number four, if I was producing, the boulder from the trailer would have made it in the movie. Number five, the Romans would have used the power of the sun to burn the enemy's plane down. Six, Helena would have flown the plane instead of jumping from a motorcycle into the landing gear. And number seven, no Helena. She just doesn't work. In Crystal Skull, Mutt and Indy at least had a fun relationship that made sense. Here's my pitch. A sidekick who reminds Indy of who he is. Someone who would get the real Indy back. 
someone who knows about all of his adventures and is just as passionate about history as he is. A fire that could reignite Indy's flame for his final farewell. This would have changed the entire dynamic and vibe of the movie. It would have felt like more of a tribute instead of a, we got the right, so let's make something with it. This might be going a bit far into fantasy, but Mutt could have had a kid off screen if we're going with the storyline that he died in the war, similarly to how he was introduced in Crystal Skull. So yes, the kid would be young, but it'd be a youthful balance to Indy's mature age, and it would naturally make for an interesting relationship. A kid that Indy could share his grief with. He could teach the kid about his father since he would have been young, if even born, when Munt died. This character could have replaced both Helena and Teddy. It would have been emotional, funny, and at least rooted in the lore. I'm not sure who thought Phoebe Waller-Bridge was the perfect choice for this role because it is completely different from Fleabag. She is not the first, second, or even third choice for someone I would have put in that role. Again, she's an acquired taste. Her humor is for a certain audience, and honestly, I don't even see her humor come across in this movie at all. Now, it's real easy for me to sit up on my perch and critique this movie, so I want to take a moment to shout out the cast and crew that worked on this film for years and put their heart and soul into it. I really appreciate the art that you created, and I hope that you're proud of this movie. This movie suffers from too many cooks in the kitchen. Everybody is trying to throw in their spice that it ends up being a dish that tastes like a whole lot of nothing. Point blank period, this was a studio cash grab. Without the cash and without the grab. Top Gun Maverick was a unique case and it just worked. It did massively well in part because the legend was training a new generation. It wasn't about Maverick, but it gave us just enough nostalgia to pull us in, and then the rest of the cast did the work to keep us there. But the success of other franchise reboots doesn't mean that yours is a good idea. The decision to greenlight this movie narratively doesn't make a lot of sense, and honestly, business-wise, it doesn't make a lot of sense either. In the end, they couldn't capture the magic that the Indiana Jones franchise was built on. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is a too late, cluttered, confusing mess of a movie that is the result of too many indies and not enough groundhogs. I give Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, it's fine. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Make Cinema. If you're craving more, check out the cards in the top right corner of your screen. My name is Jake Okoa and may the power protect you always. I'll see you next time.